Shabbat Shalom. Tonight marks the beginning of Tisha B'Av, the ninth day in the month of Av, the day on which both the first and second temples in Jerusalem were destroyed. This is the saddest day of the year on the Jewish calendar. However, because we do not mourn as a community on Shabbat, the rituals of Tisha B'Av are postponed to, observe, to be observed on Saturday night and on Sunday. What makes this day, Tisha B'Av, so important? What's the significance to us today of the temple's destruction? After all, it was a building, like other buildings. It was an ancient house of prayer, and the world has very few of those left standing. Why are we, as the Jewish people, still mourning the loss of this edifice over 1,900 years later? One answer to this question is that we're not mourning only for the loss of the first and second temples. Jewish history has given us ample events to recall with sadness. Expulsions, pogroms, massacres, genocides. On Tisha B'Av, we recall these events in Jewish history, along with the loss of the temples. But this evening, we will narrow our focus to the destruction of the Second Temple in 70 CE and arrive at an understanding of the impact its loss had on the Jewish people. With the end of the Second Temple came the end of the centralization of Jewish religion. No longer would there be one singular place in the world where we believed God rested among the Jews. We would also have no one authoritative way to practice our religion. For good and bad, Judaism would be democratized, localized, and ultimately look very little like the temple practice. The destruction of the second temple also meant that any semblance of Jewish sovereignty, which had already been significantly reduced under Roman rule, was gone. All Jews would now live under the rule of kings, queens, and then presidents and prime ministers who were not representative of the Jewish people and often were openly hostile to Jews. We would not experience self-rule for close to 1,900 years until the state of Israel was established. As the Arch of Titus in Rome depicts, priceless spoils from the temple were taken from Jerusalem and brought to Europe. But it wasn't only objects that left Judea. The Jewish population center of Jerusalem and much of Israel were exiled and dispersed. Some Jews would continue to live within the borders of Israel allowing us to claim that Jewish settlement in Israel has been constant for millennia. But the Jewish population of Israel would not regain significant numbers for a very long time. As the Second Temple's destruction is synonymous with the loss of our religious center, the loss of a population center, and the loss of Jewish sovereignty, it also marked the end of over 600 years of positive diaspora-Israel relations. The Jewish diaspora was formed by exiles from Judea following the destruction of the first temple in 586 BCE. They founded significant and thriving Jewish communities throughout the Fertile Crescent in Egypt and into Europe. While they were getting comfortable in their new homes and communities outside of Israel, only 30 years later, after the Babylonian exile began, King Cyrus of Persia issued an edict permitting the Jews to return to Israel and to rebuild their temple. A small and mighty group of visionary Jews returned to Israel and embarked on building the second temple in Jerusalem. But most Jews remained in the diaspora and built up Jewish communities outside of Israel. Between 538 BCE and 70 CE, over 600 years, the Jewish communities outside of Israel established a relationship with the Jews in Israel that flourished and was mutually beneficial. Here are just a few examples 
of what diaspora Israel relations looked like at that time. Three times each year, on the holidays of Sukkot, Passover, and Shavuot, we are commanded to go on pilgrimage to the temple in Jerusalem. Diaspora Jews at the time actually fulfilled this mitzvah. It tells in the, Torah, in the Talmud of the miracles that occurred during these festivals. The temple grounds were so filled with pilgrims that they stood shoulder to shoulder with no room to move. Yet, when it came time to bow in prayer, a miracle occurred. There was ample room for each person to pray. And during their time in Jerusalem, each pilgrim had a place to sleep and enough food to eat. While we're on miracles, I'll tell you the story of Nicanor. Nicanor, a wealthy Jew from Alexandria, Egypt, in a show of devotion, had two doors fashioned for the second temple out of bronze. As he sailed them to Israel, a storm threatened to capsize his boat. Looking to lessen the weight, they threw a door into the sea. The ship was still at risk due to the remaining door, and Nicanor said, if you throw it into the sea, throw me with it. At that moment, the storm abated, and Nicanor and the door went all the way to the Jaffa port. Upon arrival in Jaffa, a miracle occurred. The door that had been cast into the sea appeared from under the boat. And Nicanor, along with many diaspora Jews at the time, with this contribution and others, financially supported Israel's well-being. These 600 years of diaspora Israel relations reflected mutuality as well, with each community giving and taking in the relationship. For example, we all recognize the importance of water and the risk of drought in the Middle East. The holidays of Sukkot and Shemini Atzeret were observed with rituals and prayers to ensure rain in its season. Jews in Israel, along those residing outside of Israel, would pray, as we do to this day, for Israel to have rain starting around October. However, there's a second prayer, one for the diaspora that asks God for rain there as well. But this prayer, we only begin reciting it in Israel and outside of Israel in December. Why the delay? The answer goes back to those pilgrims. After Sukkot, they had to travel through the Fertile Crescent to their homes. As the name implies, it is fertile and at risk of being muddy once the rains begin. So to protect the pilgrims from getting their animals and carts stuck in the, in the mud, we, to this day, delay this prayer, encouraging the rains to fall only once everyone is safely home. When the Romans sacked the temple, 600 years of flourishing diaspora Israel relations came to an end. On Tisha B'Av, we mourn that loss as well. Tomorrow evening, I will join the Jewish people in our communal mourning. I will chant from the Book of Lamentations and abstain from food and drink, but I will not partake in the tradition of a 25-hour period of mourning. Instead, I will break my fast on Sunday afternoon, observing a partial fast of mourning on Tisha B'Av, as many Jews of liberal movements do. I do this because mourning is an act of resignation. It is what we do when we have lost agency and must accept our fate. But I am not resigned to fully mourn as part of a tragic past. Our people went almost 1,900 years without access to the Jewish nation's capital of Jerusalem. Without Jewish sovereignty in our homeland and with the loss of a Jewish population center in Israel. But today, that is no longer our reality. Almost 75 years ago, Israel declared its independence as a Jewish state. And today, we can celebrate Jewish sovereignty in our homeland which is now home to millions of Jews, including Israel's newest refugees from Ukraine, over 30,000 of them, 
many of whom are Jewish, and some of other faiths. We can celebrate that Israel is a democracy with a representative government and free and fair elections. We can take pride in Israel's contributions to the world, especially in the areas of medical research and green technology. For almost 1,900 years, we mourn the loss of diaspora Israel relations. Following the establishment of the State of Israel 75 years ago, we became empowered. On this day, on Tisha B'Av, we can identify what a healthy and generative Israel diaspora relationship looks like. Since our ancestors had 600 years to work on their relationship with Israel, I encourage us to investigate their practice, which included pilgrimage, regular trips to Israel, mutuality, not only giving to Israel, but taking in and appreciating the cultural contributions and scientific breakthroughs of the largest Jewish community anywhere in the world, and philanthropy and investment in Israel, especially at a time when there are so many calls for boycott, divestment, and sanctions of Israel, the best response to these efforts that cloak anti-Semitism and Jew hatred in the more politically acceptable anti-Zionism is to invest in Israel. By becoming angel investors, we can align our financial futures with Israel's. Together, let's continue exploring whether the example our forebears set for us two millennia ago can serve as a model for our communal and personal relationship with Israel today. It is imperative that we take this moment to reflect on our engagement with Israel because as the astute observer of the American Jewish experience, Yossi Klein Halevi has identified that with rising anti-Semitism in the US and globally, the Jewish whisper has returned. This is the hushed tone we use in public when speaking of our Judaism or our connection to Israel. The Jewish whisper is an act of resignation, just like mourning is. We must, instead of whispering, take hold of our Jewish future and act with determination and with pride. Join me this Tisha B'Av in imagining, pursuing, and establishing a renewed and unbreakable model for diaspora Israel relations that can sustain us for hundreds of years to come. Shabbat Shalom. <laughs>